All right, thank you for joining us for another Modern War Institute speaker event. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Mr. Matt Larson. Uh, I met Matt, uh, so that's sort of personal introduction. But I met Matt when I was a young specialist in Ranger Regiment in 1995. Um, when Matt was chosen by then Lieutenant Colonel Stanley McChrystal to review the regiment's hand-to-hand -hand combatives training, I almost blew him his thunder. Uh, but then started introducing ground combat to the Ranger Regiment. <coughs> Shortly thereafter, I was involved in a fight, got my ear bit off. <coughs> Not that Matt didn't teach me, but I just hadn't met Matt yet. And I saw him shortly after getting my earbud off, and all he said to me was, I couldn't help you with that. <laughs> uh, but I consider him, and I've stayed in touch with Matt for my entire 20-year career just because I'm an infantryman, um, and, and I felt combatives kind of changed my life. And it wasn't because it taught me how to roll off my platoon, which was, was important uh, to be able to do that, but it was he taught me, uh, and what I found in that fight, that being able to have the courage to move forward uh, and, and fight was very important and it became something you know, part of my identity from then on. Um, so I won't say any more of uh, what Matt's going to talk about, but it's really honored to have him part of the Modern Orange Institute Speaker Series. Thanks, Matt. Hello, everyone. Um, what I would like to talk about today is, is, not, is only peripherally about combatives. So what I'd really like to talk about is what the warrior ethos is, and what unit cohesion is, and how do we control the cultures of our organizations to make sure we have them. Okay, so with that being said, what, what do you, this is audience participation, what do you suppose the warrior ethos means? So we've got a lot of platitudes about what it means out there, and the Army's got some official things we put out, but what does it, what does it really mean? Let's think about that for a second. Because <clears throat> I think the definition is pretty simple. And it means that you're willing to close with the enemy. So what I mean, what, to put that in more stark terms, imagine there's a building down the street from where you're at, and it's full of people who would like to kill you. The warrior is the one who's willing to go in that building and try to kill them. Now, that's a pretty tall order. And if you start evaluating people whether or not they have that, you're going to be a lot closer to the truth of the warrior ethos than all the other platitudes you've heard. In the combatants program, we always say that the defining characteristic of a warrior is the willingness to close with the enemy. And that, that's really true. So, so think about that for a second. And then, how many of y'all heard of the 507th Maintenance Unit? Some of y'all? Okay, so, or Jessica Lynch. Y'all heard of her, Private Lynch? She was... Uh, captured early in the war in Iraq, and her unit was the 507th Maintenance Unit. And if you ever have the time, I, I would recommend you go read the after-action reviews from their unit's incident. But basically what happened was they got lost, and after they got lost, they got ambushed, and then in the ambush, they essentially got wiped out, killed and captured, a whole bunch of them. So <clears throat> there's a couple of very interesting things about that. The first one is, why do they get lost? So everything I say about this unit should be catched in the, in the fact that they had the requisite number of officers and non-commissioned officers. They had a company commander, they had platoon leaders, they had a first sergeant, they had platoon sergeants. How does an organization with all those people get lost? Well, most likely because none of those people thought about the fact that they were going to have to be experts at land nav at some point in their life. And the most important lesson, though, the most important tidbit in that after-action review <clears throat> is that every weapon in the unit, every rifle, pistol, machine gun, every weapon in the unit malfunctioned. Now, how does that happen? The obvious answer is that they didn't do any weapons maintenance, right? But why didn't they do any weapons maintenance? Well, the answer to that is they didn't think they would have to be the ones doing the fighting. So the Army at that time, any, if anybody who was in, in the room who was in the Army at that time, it was bifurcated. We had the Army that we thought was like the combat portion of the Army. So we had, you know, combat MOSs and, and 
We had non-combat or combat support, combat services support MOSs. People used to actually call them non-combat MOSs. So imagine you're a person in one of those non-combat MOSs. Well, since we were at peace through most of the late 70s, 80s, and 90s, all those portions of the Army started thinking of themselves as the people who wouldn't be doing the fighting. So <clears throat> imagine the 507th Maintenance Unit. They were probably really good at some stuff. I don't know what it was because I don't really know what that unit did, but you get the idea. What they didn't do was think about themselves as fighters. And since they didn't think about themselves as fighters, when they got over there, they probably strapped their rifles into their five tons, and there they sat through all the dust and everything that else had happened until it, they got lost because nobody had thought they would need to know land nav, and then they didn't have the first clue about what to do when they started fighting because that wasn't their job, right? So <clears throat> what does the warrior ethos mean? It means something that they didn't have. Now, with that being said, how do we get to where we want to be such that everybody remembers they're the ones who will do the fighting? So I'll tell you another story. Once upon a time, I had the chief of staff of the Army and a sergeant major of, my, of the Army in, in my gym. Or the, this was before it was the Army Combative School, so it was really just an old book warehouse on uh, Fort Benning. And, so they came in, imagine the entourage that's with those people, you know, there's probably 50 people in the room. And so I said to the group, who's the best runner in the group? And everybody knew immediately, they were like, oh, it's Major Longlegs, you know, he just won the Marine Corps Marathon or whatever, you know. So I was like, ah, it's great, you know, I'm a big fan of running, it's awesome. Uh, who's the best shot? And of course, then there were crickets, right? Nobody had any idea who the best shot was. And I said, okay, and who's the best fighter? And once again, crickets, nobody had any idea who the best fighter was. And so I said, so what you're telling me is that this organization has selected running as more important than shooting and fighting. Which is cool if we're going to run from the enemy. Right? But if we're going to run towards the enemy, with every step, the shooting and fighting are going to get more important, right? So, so think about that for a second, because it's undeniably true that they valued running. And they probably thought they valued the other two, but they didn't in fact, or else they would have known who was good at it, right? So why? Why? It's not like somebody made a conscious choice and said, running is more important than shooting and fighting, so we're going to concentrate on that in the culture of this organization. Nobody made that choice, right? So why then did they value running over shooting and fighting? Well, here's why. Because in the Army, most everybody in the Army falls out in the morning, they... Right face, forward march, double time, and the unit goes out on a run, right? And so what happens like a mile into that run? Well, the first person starts to fall back. And what do we all think of that person? Yeah, right. We don't even have to enunciate it, right? Because everybody in the room knows exactly what we think of that person, right? And, and the truth is, even that turd wishes some other turd would fall out first because they don't want to be the one who's that person, right? So we all value running. And we all wish we were better at it, because later on in that run, what will happen is they'll say, maybe release, and then all the rabbits take off, right? And so everybody wishes that they were one of those rabbits. They may not wish it enough to go out and do the running that it takes to be one of those rabbits, but everybody wishes they were better at it, because there is both the threat of public humiliation and the promise of accolades associated with being a good runner. And I'll just tell you, for all you guys who are you know, looking at a career in the Army, know right now that you can't be successful in the Army if you can't pass that one little test right there because as a culture, we value that, okay? So with that being said, why not shooting? Well, because what happens when you go to the range? Here's what happens. The only people who know how you did are probably you, the person who helped you finger whip your score, and then perhaps the company clerk, right? and nobody else. So how do we change that? What if, what if we came back from the range and we posted all those scores? We know what would happen. People would walk up to the list and they'd see it and they'd go, Larson, you shot a 14. You know, why do we even give you a rifle? We should give you a sharp stick or you know, make you carry heavy things for the people who can shoot or all the smack talking would begin, right? Because that's just the nature of, of an organization. 
So what would happen would be that the peer pressure would then be on to perform. And the next time we went to the range, everybody would be that much more likely to try harder because there's something at stake. You understand my point, right? So how do we capture that with fighting? Well, I'll tell you how we used to do it in the old days in the 2nd Ranger Battalion. And this is not the way I'm suggesting to do it, but I'm just kind of giving you the uh, what you can do if you have a sufficiently motivated unit sort of idea. And we'll come back on what you can do in your unit. But on payday activities in those days, that's how old I am, we used to have payday activities. <clears throat> the battalion sergeant major used to call people out at random. It would be like, uh, give me the, the second squad leader, third platoon, Charlie Company, and the first squad leader, first platoon, Alf Company. And those guys would fall out in front of the battalion, and they had had to fight. So think about how that plays out, right? Because this is how it plays out. Everybody know that person in your unit who doesn't like combatives and they're this, this I would just shoot you guy, right? The, the proverbial I would just shoot you guy, right? Here's what happens. They run in their mouth back there, I would just shoot you, and then their name gets called out. Then they fall out in front of the battalion. Then they get twisted up like somebody's trying to close the bread with them, right? Or like, like a piece of paper you're finished with or something. And then they run back to their platoon. And now what happens? Everybody knows what this is about. We all know at that point that it's just a smack talking pansy because that's the truth. Right? We used to sell t shirts in the old days in the combatives program that said, We both know why you don't train. And we do, right? Like it's not supposition. We both know why. Okay? So what happens in a unit like that is that you cannot survive socially if you are not a good fighter. <coughs> Just like you can't survive if you're not a good runner. Just like you shouldn't be able to survive if you're not a good shot. Okay? So that's like the Neanderthal way, the way, you know, when we were just starting to do this, the, uh, hey, check it out, wham, right? That sort of way. But there's a lots of other ways you can get to the same thing, the same idea. How do we make it where, in your organization, the culture demands that you have the skill sets that we need you to have? or the attributes that we need you to have. Because this is about controlling the culture of your unit. How do you control the culture of your unit so that the concept of being squared away in that unit, think about that for a second. What does the word squared away mean, or the two words? What does it mean, squared away, right? How do you control that? That's what we're talking about now, okay? Because I'm a simpleton. <laughs> My concept of squared away means that you're the person we need in that job, right? And if that job is being a soldier, that means you're the person that I want with me when we go down range. And if it means something else, I think it's pretty broken. You know, I had to put the, the mission of the Army up there on the board because this is uh, it's from the Army webpage, by the way. Because you can look at everything we do in that light. Everything we do. So being squared away, what does it mean? Well, it should mean that you're serving that, right? That you're the person ready to do that. Execute our mission. Intimidate the bad guys so we don't have to have a war. And if we do have to have a war, we crush them. Right? Because we're squared away. Okay, so to give you a little bit of an idea how you could do that in some other way. <clears throat> There's a, rest, there's a drill that uh, they do in wrestling. It's called pummeling. It's basically, most of my students all know it. It's a pretty simple concept. You can teach it to people in like five minutes, less than that. You can probably teach it to people in 30 seconds. But then you can do it competitively. In other words, you can fight each other with it. And so how do we get it where everybody has to have that, that they're squared away, that we value, that they're a good fighter? Well, you can introduce that little five-minute drill into your PT time. You can say, for example, tomorrow we're going to go out and we're going to do a run, we're going to do sit-ups, we're going to do crunches, we're going to do whatever, and then we're going to do three five-minute rounds or three three-minute rounds of pummeling. And all of a sudden, without, there's not any real way to get around it, all of a sudden everybody in the unit is starting to learn to fight. Because that drill translates really quickly into who's got control of the weapons in the fight, and that's what hand-to-hand -hand on the battlefield is actually all about, who's going to control the weapons. Okay? So, then you can do that once every couple of weeks, and pretty soon you can introduce the next little step, and the next little step, and the next little step, and soon enough you have an organization where it is not socially acceptable 
to not be a good fighter. Because if you want to have an organization where everybody remembers that they're the ones who have to do the fighting, the best tool we have is to be able to make them do the fighting. It's easy in lots of portions of the Army where your job may be something that seems pretty unrelated to it to forget that there's a reason why everybody in the Army wears this camouflage outfit. And I'll tell you, just so we're all clear on that, why do we wear this camouflage outfit? Because every one of us might have to hide from people who are trying to kill us. Or we might have to hide from people while we're sneaking up to kill them. That's what it's about. When you put that outfit on, you should remember that every morning. Oh, check it out. I'm, in the, I'm going to sneak up on people and kill them outfit. Okay? And that's especially when you have some part of the arm, some job in the Army where it's not obvious because you're the 507th maintenance unit at that point. And you're either going to remember that you're the fighter or you're going to forget that you're the fighter. And if you remember it, then you're going to do your weapons maintenance. Then you're going to understand fire maneuver. Then you're going to know how to maneuver your squad. Maybe it's a whole bunch of cooks, bakers, or candlestick makers. It doesn't make any difference. Those people need to be fighters too. So with that being said, and keeping that in context that we need to be fighters, let's talk a little bit about unit cohesion and how we, what do I mean by that concept, what the, what the concept means, okay? So there used to be this drill in the combatives program. It was called uh, the Achieve the Clinch Drill. It's since been changed a little bit. And you have to remember that where I'm talking about is from a different time. This was 1995, 1996 kind of time frame. And the way the drill used to go was, to teach people to be aggressive in the fight. So let me, let me back up a step and put this in context, okay? When the war in Iraq and Afghanistan started, the doctrine for close quarters battle, okay, if you had a weapons malfunction, you had one of two things going. Either you were the sort of person that might have a sidearm or you were not. Most of the army was the you were not. So the doctrine for close quarters battle at that time was if your weapon malfunctioned when you were in the room, that you would take a knee and then have the other person shoot him. Okay, so, or you would transition to your sidearm. So think about that for a second, okay? It seems to make a little bit of sense, but how big do you suppose the average room in Iraq or Afghanistan is? Yeah, not very big. Okay, everybody who's been over there can tell you. Eight or 10 feet is a pretty normal room there. So your eight or 10 feet to the deepest, darkest corner of the room when you come through the door. So what does that really mean? Okay, that means that whenever you go through that door, you're this close to them when you start. We're probably six or seven feet away right now. If he was standing in the deepest, darkest corner of an eight-foot room, that's how close we'd be. When I came through the door. So I'm going to go through the door, click, crap, now what? Take a knee. Whoever came up with that didn't want to admit that this is about fighting. Because the truth is, you bang into them, and then you dominate them physically. Okay? And then maybe your buddy comes over and helps you shoot the guy. But if you take a knee at his foot, if you do what the doctor said to do, 2003, then all you're going to do is just be his victim. Okay? And, the, and the other side of the army wasn't much better. The high, I've got a sidearm thing. Because now, look, click, crap, now what? Unless you're coming through that door to stand right in the fatal funnel, that's also an idiotic plan. So what really happens? Same thing. Click, crap, bam! You smash into them, you dominate them physically, and then you get your side on them out. In other words, close-range gunfighting is about hand-to-hand -hand combat. It's an integral part of it. We used to do post-action interviews with people who got into hand-to-hand -hand fights on the battlefield. We have hundreds of them, and, or we had hundreds of them. And with that being said, there's a couple of things that always happen. The first one is it's always grappling, right? It's, what I mean by that is not like ground grappling or anything like that. It's always grappling in that there's a reason why we didn't shoot them from across the room or they didn't shoot us from across the room. And whatever that reason is, that's the reason we grabbed them or they grabbed us. And you can see in that 8x8 eight eight room, that happens pretty frequently, okay? The second one is it's never just grappling. We're not trying to teach a bunch of people to be like jujitsu people or whatever, judo, etc. It's none of that because it's grappling with strikes 
And more importantly, it's grappling with weapons. Okay, so we're always armed. The bad guys are usually armed. And think about this for a second. When you go through life, right, if you're talking about real no-joke fights, winning no-joke fights, right, when can you not be armed? Imagine I was going to get on the airplane today and I was flying off to London. Could I be armed? Yes, I could, because they're not going to stop me from having a ballpoint pen in my pocket. And if somebody grabs me from behind and I pull the ballpoint pen out of my pocket and jam it into their arm, it's going to be much easier to get out of their grasp. And otherwise, I'm armed. Okay. So, <clears throat> with that being said, how do we inculcate that in our units? Well, we had this drill. And the purpose of the drill was to teach people that. And what we would do was we would put boxing gloves on the, on the, on the cadre, and then the students would all have to come in, get through the boxing range, and grab you so that you couldn't hit them. Okay? It's not, not much important about it, but <clears throat> except for the point that you had to have courage to do it. Right? Now, that being said, when we started the drill, once again, this is 20 years ago, the way it used to go would be I'd say, okay, what happens in a fight if you try to quit? It's just really easy to kick your butt, right? So what do you think would happen to people, or what we would tell them, what's going to happen to you if you try to quit in here? And we're just going to keep hitting you. There's no quitting. And I used to have there's this big bay door in our old building there. I used to open the big bay door, and I'd say, look, you're going to be in this drill one of two ways. You're either going to be successful, meaning you're going to get inside and stop us from hitting you, or you're going to flee out that door. And what happens if you flee out that door? Nothing. We're just going to make fun of you. That's it. You're out. Leave this to the warriors. Okay? So here's what would happen in the drill. We'd start going along in there, and everybody had to do four iterations of it. So everybody'd start going along in there, and eventually somebody would get scared, and we'd chase them out the door. Okay? You know, they'd fold up in the fetal position or something first, and we'd keep hitting them in the butt or the back or someplace where it wouldn't hurt them, you know. The whole idea was psychological pressure, not to hurt them. But most people would just explode up out of that and attack you, and you didn't succeed, right? And be like, yeah, good on you. Okay? Overcame your fears, made it happen, here we go. But eventually somebody would flee out the door. So I would send somebody out after him. I would say, okay, you know, go out and get that guy back in here, you know. And that would never work. But they'd go back, they'd go out there and try to talk him in. And pretty soon after I had the first one, the second one would happen. And after the second one, pretty soon the third one would happen. And when the third one happened, I would stop the drill. This happened almost every class in those days. I'd stop the drill. And I'd bring those people who were, had fled the battlefield back in. And I'd set them all down, and I'd tell them this story. So I want you to picture this for a second. Imagine Pickett's Charge. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, right? So the field is like a mile across. If you've been there, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So when the morning came, 20,000 or so soldiers in the wood line, the order came to move out across the, the field. So they all started walking across. They're walking because it's far, you know, it's pretty long ways across. And as they crested up out of the wood line, the people on the other side of the field noticed them and started shooting artillery at them. So think about that for a second. Put yourself in their shoes, right? You're walking across the field, you and all your buddies, and they start shooting artillery at you. So the artillery rounds are coming at you, they're big as your fist. And they're coming like 12 or 1300 feet per second, maybe something like that, which means you can almost see them as they come across. In fact, there's not a lot of descriptions of the uh, various similar charges where they said you could see the cannonballs coming at them. So we're walking across a volley of, a volley of artillery shoots. They come across the field, and then they take out 20 guys. You know, 20 people, leg knocked off, head blown off. Why does everybody keep walking? Because I can tell you the truth, there's not a single person on that field, from the lowest private to the commander, who wants to keep walking. No one. Every single person on the field wants to leave the field. So why do they keep going? Well, the answer is because they're not by themselves. It's not Matt walking across the field. It's Matt walking across the field between you two guys. And so what keeps everybody walking is they don't want to be publicly humiliated. Because the truth is, it's 
The threat of public humiliation is a more powerful motivator under circumstan certain circumstances than the fear of death. So everybody keeps walking. <coughs> so as they start getting closer and closer to the enemy lines and more and more people are getting killed by the artillery, eventually they're going to get within musketry range, right? So at 300 meters or something like that, the first volley probably opens up and people drop like flies. Eventually, it, as it gets more and more scary and more and more like death is coming up to be imminent, eventually somebody's going to fake it, right? Like they're going to get, like act like they got shot when one of those volleys comes down and lay down amongst the, the people who are really shot and act like they, so they can get out, right? So that, that's probably the first thing that happens. But then eventually, as you get a little closer, somebody overcomes that surface tension of unit cohesion and flees. And when the first person does, well, it's not too long before the second person does. And once the second does, then the third, and pretty soon it becomes socially acceptable within that unit to be a coward, and the whole unit flees off the battlefield. And that's exactly the process that goes down, and that's called a breakdown in unit cohesion. That's what that means. And I would go back to the students and tell them, and that's exactly what's happening in this room right now. It is becoming socially acceptable to be a coward. And then I'd start to drill back up and everybody would always make it. <clears throat> and I'm telling you this stuff because I want you to think about it in terms of how do you control what's going on in your unit. When you're the leader of the unit, this is... Your task. Your task is to not just overtly set the priorities, lead the missions, etc. Your job is to control the culture. Control the culture of the unit to make sure that the values of the people in the unit are what you need them to be. Because that's how you make sure that people are doing a weapons maintenance, right? That's how you make sure that people know how to land that. That's how you make sure that people know how to treat, you know, have no trauma medicine so that when their buddy gets wounded, they know what to do. You make a culture that demands that of everybody, and pretty soon you'll have it. If you, you want to know the best way to get everybody to know how to fight in your unit, make it a unit where you have to be able to fight to be socially acceptable in the unit. And guess what? Everyone will learn how. It's as simple as that. You won't even have to teach them. That's not your job as a leader to go out there and teach them how to fight. Your job is to go out there and create conditions where they all want to know how to fight and they learn on their own. And the unit leaders, will, the subunit leaders will all take charge and make it happen. And understanding that, that that's what you're doing at the top is pulling the levers to control the culture to get what you want. That's a really valuable lesson and a really important thing to understand about how you lead and how you make decisions of consequence, how you make a, a unit that has consequence. I always like to say the most thing that I'm most proud of in my career, I was in, a, I was in the Marine Corps for four years, and then I was in the Army for uh, almost 19, most of that in the Ranger Regiment. And the thing I always say that I'm most proud of is not, so I was a Ranger squad leader for almost seven years. So that's, that was quite a good job, but more importantly, Almost every one of my men, in fact, I think every one of the people who worked for me during those seven years re-enlisted. Because that's what having a positive culture is, right? Have a culture full of people who know how to fight, have a culture full of people who, who would value the ability to be able to shoot, a culture of people who, you know, who have a healthy, you know, do PT, you know? This week I was, I was <clears throat> wrote a, co-wrote a book about snipers years ago. I was interviewing a bunch of people and I was, struck while we were interviewing them about the different cultures of the organizations they were part of. And so one of the organizations that, which will remain nameless, but one of the organizations that we interviewed the people from, they, they had sort of a, we'll call it a work hard, play hard um, mindset. They thought of themselves as hard guys, and they were, and they were, and they, and they were hard at work, rucking hard, doing all the right stuff, but they also had a play hard mentality, so when they got off, they played hard too, and by their version of playing hard, I mean, I mean like they all went drinking and they all, all that sort of stuff, right? So they had half of a positive culture, right? They worked hard, but 
How much easier would it have been, or how much better would it have been if the leaders in that unit had created a culture where play hard meant that they were going to go do physical things for their enjoyment? Because it's not, it's only like a social decision that we're going to, instead of going to do that this weekend, we're going to go climbing, or we're going to go running, or we're going to go, you know, something like that play some game, something physical, something positive. And that's the organization where everybody's taking care of themselves. And that's the organization where everybody is coming out, is, is healthy, right? And more fit and stronger and et cetera. And those are the levers you have. Combatives are such a great example of that because you know why you get fit when you're in a unit that values combatives? Because if you don't, you get beat up and humiliated. <laughs> so everybody wants to be fit because their social status is depending upon it. It's just like that run. Like I said, everybody wants to be a better runner, and that's why. <laughs> Understand that that's how you set the conditions. You control the levers of your culture. Okay. So, <clears throat> with all that being said, what other ways can we control it? What other things do we have? I'll give you another example of the way we do that sort of thing in the Army. Imagine a kid, if you will, who grows up in a place where stealing is the way to get by. Okay? And you can imagine that very easily without me drawing a picture of the place, but it's, there's lots of places in this world where the way to get by is stealing. And everybody in that culture thinks it's okay to steal because they don't have anything, and so that's how they're going to get it, right? What does the Army do to break them of that? What does the Army do to change their values? Well, here's what we do. We put you to live in a room full of people. When I was in basic training, I think it was 80 people living all in one room, right? So what happens in that culture where it is absolutely not socially acceptable to be a thief? You know, imagine, Private Larson comes back in, and I don't have uh, PT gear clean because I'm lazy, and so I'm going to go look in the dryer and snatch some out, right? What if somebody had put their name on it and I didn't notice? What's going to happen in that organization? Yeah, it's not socially acceptable to be a thief, in other words. And everybody's going to be like, ah, that's the thief. So what happens in that organization? Everybody stops being thieves, at least overtly, and the value, of the value set of the culture is different than the place where that person was from. Because all of a sudden, it's not just the cool thing to do to steal, it's screwing over your friends, right? Everybody get the idea? So... Probably never thought of it in that light, but that's really what we do. And if you think of those in those terms, pretty soon you can control your culture of your organization across all the various aspects of it. Okay? So I'm not going to talk too terrible long, but I want to I come back to that point up on the board. What are we about as an army? And how do we make sure we're about that? How do we make sure that we don't have that bifurcated army of the 80s? Well, we make sure that whatever it is we're up to, let's just imagine just to pull something out of a hat, that tomorrow I got assigned to a unit and we are responsible for the field laundry, right? How do I make sure those people who work with me and my organization there has that warrior ethos, that warrior culture? We set the conditions and make them. We put the scores on the wall. We have them fighting. We start doing those things and pretty soon they will. So with that being said, I'll open up for questions. So if you have a question, wait for the mic, so that way we can get it for the recording. Uh, I'll let you guys think about the question. Matt, I'll ask the first question. Okay. Because, like I said, my similar story was uh, I was in, in a civilian fight, but <coughs> was getting ready to enter a ring and uh, had self-doubt and the ability to, to move forward, to take that extra step, and I was a, with a group of rangers. And I would never let them down by not taking that, that step into what it would mean to me and the organization. Uh, you tell a story about a similar situation that happened in combat um, where a sergeant major has to close with, close with, he has a weapons malfunction. There's some individuals that, that didn't have that warrior with those and some that did. I was wondering if you could share that story. Yeah, so we didn't get, um, <clears throat> we didn't get time to get the photos approved, but I was going to put a picture up here that a photographer named Michael Yawn took of a, a friend of ours named Rob Prosser, who was a sergeant major of a, one of the striker battalions in the, in the heat of the war, like 2007 or 2008 or something like that. And he worked for a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Carrilla, who's now a general officer. 
And in their deployment, it was right when the war was really heavy, and at one point, uh, without going into the whole story of what happened, Colonel Carrillo was moving down the, an alleyway with his, you know, he was a battalion commander, so he had the guys that the battalion commander has with him, the commo guy and et cetera. And as he passed in front of a door, a bad guy shot him outside the door. So he was in the middle of the alley, he took three rounds. So while he was getting shot, he was moving forward, it happened, so he sort of returned fire, and as he returned fire, he fell a little bit out of the, the area where that person was shooting, or so he wasn't shot, you know, five more times. But the people behind him in the, in the row, this is the, according to the photographer, the people behind him in the row, none of them returned fire, and none of them certainly went through the door. And then eventually, the, sergeant, the battalion sergeant major, Rob Prosser, who for the record is a pretty tough guy, he pushed past everybody. He engaged the, through the doorway, and as he was going through the doorway, he ran out of ammunition because they were involved in a larger fight when this happened. And so when he ran out of ammunition, he ran through the door and tackled the bad guy and got on top of him. And then <clears throat> uh, as he got on top of him, the bad guy pulled his helmet off of him and he held him down with one hand and then smashed him with his helmet on the other one. And the picture I was going to post up is after he drugged this guy's either lifeless or mostly lifeless body back out into the road, he was standing there with the guy's blood all over him. It's a pretty epic picture. <clears throat> But the point behind it is this, right? So it's pretty obvious that he had the warrior ethos. He had just seen his boss and his friend shot, <clears throat> and he ran past everybody else in the group to be the one going through that door, right? <clears throat> so it's also obvious that the other people didn't necessarily have it. <clears throat> Why weren't they running through? Why wasn't the next guy in line there with his rifle right there? Well. We know why, right? That's an overwhelmingly scary thing. Your life is on the line. It's heroic to go through that door. But how do we build that in us where we're the one? And how do we build it in our, into our soldiers? That's really what we're talking about, right? And you know, just to sort of expand on the point, think about this. How do you, think about the Army values, right? And one of them is courage, right? How do we build that? if we don't do things that are scary. So it's pretty, easy to, it's pretty easy to imagine a soldier who came in the Army, let's just say in 1977, just to pull a number out of my hat, they came in the Army at that time, they weren't even doing pugil stick training and basic training, so they, they came in and then maybe did rappelling or something like that as the scariest thing in basic training, and they got to their unit, whatever crazy unit they were at in the Army. It's easy to imagine they could go a whole career without ever again doing something terrifying Maybe repelling was the scariest thing they ever did in their career. And then 15 or 18 or 20 years later, it's time to go to war. And all of a sudden, there's lives on the line. And how did we inculcate the warrior ethos into this person? Made him memorize some platitudes? You know? No, the only way to do it is to make them do things that are scary so that you get used to it. So you get used to overcoming your fears. So like you said, when you step out, onto the, step out on the mat on a combative tournament, you're doing that, overcoming your fears. When you're jumping out of an airplane, you know, walking towards the door, that is not too dissimilar from going to the, through the door where there's bad guys in there. It's not that much different. You know? I always like to, there's a host of examples like that. Why do you think we make people repel in basic training, right? I was only in the Army for 22 years, as I said, and, and, and in all that time, guess how many times I... I used repelling operationally. Yeah, I can't remember one, right? So then why do we have every, if you can get 20 years in a Ranger Regiment without repelling, how can we do it to everybody in basic training? Well, because it's scary. Because overcoming that top of that wall is scary. And overcoming your fears is part of being a soldier. And we have to have ways where we inculcate that. And if we're gonna, if we're gonna make sure we have the right people, you know, every time we have a long period of peace, we go to war again, we're always surprised who the heroes were. There's a, there's a plethora of stories out there where a unit goes and the per person everybody thought was the hard ass, you know, everybody thinks well, that guy was the tough guy, turns out not so much. It's, you'll find those every time there's a new group going to war. So how do we not have that? Well, 
We're going to have that if nothing we do is scary. And with that same being said, how do we not inculcate the warrior ethos? I'm not saying not to do any of this stuff, but it doesn't do that for you. How does going to the rifle range scare you? If, if going to the rifle range was scary, we would have half as many people at the SHOT Show, right? And they wouldn't be selling, you know, size 58, 511 pants down there. Because a whole lot of people want to put up the front that they're a tough guy, but they don't want to do the tough guy stuff. You know? It's really true. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> no. yes. All right, so I'll take questions from the crowd here. Any other questions? Uh, sir, Captain Merkley, Department of Foreign Languages. Uh, you mentioned in the Ranger Regiment you would have squad leaders who would fight each other, and then obviously one would lose. How did the unit uh, deal with the sudden loss of status, where you, where it was socially unacceptable not to win in fight? How, how would you deal with that as a leader? Squad leader now loses face in front of soldiers and in a platoon, etc. That's a great question. So, here's what ends up really happening: How many people actually lose face? Very, very few. Because what do the men really require of you? It's not that you be the best hand-to-hand -hand combat fighter in the unit, right? Yeah, that you don't quit, that you're competent, that you're tough, right? So to, to give you a good example, uh, the, the current chief of staff of the Army, General Milley, when he was the three corps commander at Fort Hood, when they had their combatives championships, he made all the brigade commanders and brigade sergeants major fight each other at the championships, in front of the crowd. So, so think about that for a second, right? First off, how cool it is that that's the guy we have to be in the chief of staff of the army. And second off, <clears throat> and second off, what does it take? What do, what do the soldiers demand of you, demand of their leaders? Because what they don't demand is that you be the best hand-to-hand -hand combat fighter. So in the early days of this, we had a, they had a commander named Castles who retired later as a colonel. But uh, when he was a captain, he was a really small person. He weighed like 135 pounds or something like that. And he was super scrappy, right? So he would get out there with the guys all the time and, and fight. And of course, since he was small, he'd get beat a lot, right? Because when you're 130, because no matter what anybody says, size and strength actually do matter, right? <laughs> so <laughs> with that being said, what do you suppose the soldiers thought of him? Well, everybody thought he was a stud, right? Because the men don't demand that you be the toughest guy. They demand that you be a stud, and that's not the same thing, right? So, so what happens in that unit is very quickly you have one or two people like that, and they get outed because they are, in fact, pansies, and they probably don't deserve to be, don't belong there. And then once that happens, and they can recoup, what if that happens, then they get back out there and scrap, and pretty soon they have one good showing, and they're back in everybody's good graces, right? It's the same thing if I fall out of a run, right? If I go out tomorrow, we're on a ruck, we're on a road march or something, and I'm the last guy and fall out, everybody's going to think that of me, right? I'm going to have that immediate, like, whoosh, shrinking of my status level. Hopefully when we go on a run the next day and I'm a rabbit and run them all out, I'm right back up. If I maintain my position as the person who's not good at it, then I stay. So that's a really important lesson because imagine it, in combatives, the two biggest obstacles in combatives, one of them is there's 10,000 sources of bad information and we have, a, we have a thousand, you know, who flung poo people teaching the death touch who want to sell it to the army and we have commanders who don't know any better so they'll buy it, right? So that's one. But, but the other one is that leaders are scared of losing their status and so they don't want to do it, okay? So I would, I would say that, you know, that is not any different than saying, well, first off, there's no intellectual argument that soldiers don't need to know how to fight. Right? There's nobody who can stand in front of a group of people and say, yeah, soldiers don't need to know how to fight. That's not for soldiers. Right? So that doesn't make any sense at all. And as soon as they say it, everybody knows it's foolish, right? But that doesn't mean that people won't like, like quietly try to shift away from it. They all will. But what's exactly as if I said, okay, you guys all need to be good at road marching. You guys go out and road march tomorrow, and I have a, a very important things to do back here at the office, right? It's exactly the same thing. We, we, all know that we're gonna say, let's, we all know that we shouldn't be sending our soldiers out to do stuff we're not willing to do. But we also know that this is not purely a, a my choice sort of thing. I don't get to choose what the demands of the battlefield are, right? 
the demands of the battlefield are X. Right? And the army has a great system for picking this all out. So, so you know, because we fight wars and people get killed. So, uh, and, and imagine that, for example, just to kind of put it all in context. When do you think the last time a group of U.S. soldiers went into a building and they could shoot everybody in there? So maybe 2003, right? That hasn't happened in a long time anyway. So why do we send soldiers into buildings? I had a stepbrother who was a, who was a tanker. You know, his version of, of uh, urban combat was a main gun round. At, you know, yeah, check it out. <laughs> Building clear, right? So, so why, why isn't that the only answer we have? Because that's a pretty good answer, right? You know, if we can kill everybody in that building, we can send cruise missiles, and we don't have to send soldiers. If we... We could send soldiers to go take charge of the rubble, you know. <clears throat> but if we can't kill everybody in that building, that's why we have to send soldiers. And if we can't kill everybody in the building, that means that we're going to be grabbing people. And that means that every single operation we're going to do is going to be involving manhandling people, and that's combatives. Like I said, the Army has a whole list of tasks. You know, you know, you guys are all familiar with it, I'm sure. You know, you have a big sheet there in the battalion of all the metal tasks, and you, every one of them you're putting on the board. Is that a T for trained, or is that a, you know, U for untrained, or what else? We have this whole list of tasks, right? And a whole lot of them are things like enter and clear a building. So, we've just discussed how big the average room is in Iraq, and that you're going to be laying hands on people. So, can you be a T at that task and not have hand-to-hand -hand combat skills? The answer is no, you cannot. You can kid yourself about it. You can act as if we're not going to be grabbing people when we're at war, but you are going to be grabbing people. You are going to be fighting people. Okay? So there's a host of other ones, too, though. Imagine this. Traffic control point, right? There's units all over the Army that have that as a mission. So you can set up all the training. You can run your sticks lanes. You can do all that stuff. You can, how are we going to organize it? You people are going to stand here. We have the cones like this. We're going to put the barbed wire here. All that stuff, right? And then what's going to happen in battle is a vehicle is going to come up to it. And it's going to be full of people. And so what if these people don't do what you say? Now what? Are you going to shoot them? Because that's the option you've got if you don't train hand-to-hand, -hand, right? Do as I say or else I'm going to shoot you. Not necessarily the best answer, you know? In the early part of the war, in the early part of the war, we used to think that all the combat would happen, all the hand-to-hand -hand combat would happen like, you know, weapons malfunction in the room or something, right? And the way we used to train it was close the gap, dominate positionally, then win the fight. But eventually as the war progressed, that's how we, it's not how all the fights ended up happening. What we found out pretty soon was you go through the door and there's some old man like this, right? And behind him is a curtain, and who knows what's behind that curtain? Let's just assume it's either A, a bomb factory, and it's you know, back there full of nuclear weapons or something, right? Or, B, it's, it's his wife and his daughters, and they're back there naked, and he doesn't want you to see them. So there's a language barrier. You try to tell the guy what to do. He's standing there giving you that look, you know, and now what? At some point, you've got to go over and take charge of the guy, right? So you're taking charge of this guy. Even if he starts resisting you, is he a bad guy? You have no idea still, because you're not behind the curtain, right? So he grabs your rifle. There's no ROE in the world that won't let you shoot the guy, but what if you shoot the guy? Now the whole town knows you just shot old man Jones who wasn't hurting a fly, and we've just lost the fight in that town because you're a murderer, right? So how do you control this? Well, if your soldiers don't know how to fight, you shoot the guy, and then you lose the fight. You know? Or you easily manhandle the guy. Because it's super easy when you start learning how to fight. You know, the number one comment from people, post action interviews I've done, uh, from people who got in fights on, on is, is like fighting a white belt. You know why they say that? Because it is fighting a white belt, right? You're fighting untrained people. And once you start learning how to fight in combatives, you soon find out how simple it is. That's the most amazing thing about combatives. The hardest part is overcoming the ego. Once you get past that, it's really easy to learn. And then all of a sudden, you can manhandle everybody because they don't know what you're doing. It's like you're playing baseball against people who don't know that after they hit the ball, they're supposed to run to first. How hard is it to beat those people at baseball, right? Well, fighting is just that way. There's a set of things you need to do, and once you learn them, oh, wow, it's really easy. That guy didn't know what I was trying to do. So I hope that answers your question. So. All right, any other? We have time for one last question or 
Come on, one more. Sir, Cadet Oppenheim. Oppenheim, Company F1. How do you balance the uh, practice of what are considered undesirable um, moves or practices in training with those same techniques that might be practical or useful in reality, such as eye gouging, those sorts of things? Okay, it's a good question. So one of the key reasons why the combatives program that we designed in those days was successful is because we figured out the answers to some of those questions. And imagine this, the Army has had a combatives program since forever. The very first Army hand-to-hand -hand combat manual that we had was a bayonet fighting manual translated from the French by George McClellan. So that's how long we've had hand-to-hand -hand combat training going on in the Army. Now, with that being said, up until World War I, it was bayonet fencing. That was actually an Olympic sport up until the 36 Olympics. It was, you know, foil, FP, saber, and, and bayonet. And then what happened was the battlefield of World War I showed that that was not a program that was sustainable. Not because the bayonet fencing wasn't practical, more because we had a mass army, and when you're training a million people to do something in four weeks of training before they go to combat, you can't give them skill in anything, right? So with that being said, from that time forward, we had a no-skill system in the Army, all the way until, you know, the, the, 19, the 2002 manual. So with a no-skill system, that's the bayonet assault course, it's pugil sticks, all things where we're assuming you're not going to give people any skill, and as the saying used to go in those days, you're going to teach them just enough to get their butt kicked when they go home, right? So the reason I'm saying all that is because what we changed was we added competitions. So competition is a double-edged sword. The first edge is that you get, there's no other way to get the elite level of skill or the highest level of skills. So you think about, the, we've, there's a reason why the most elite units in the world still hire the, the guys like Jerry Bernhardt, Rob Latham, and those guys to help teach them how to shoot. If you know who those guys are, the best practical shooting competitors in the world, or some of them. So, why do we hire those guys? Because the competition has driven them to excellence. If you can watch any you know, elite level thing people are doing in the Olympics and look at how the excellence is created by the competitions, okay? But what happens in, in fighting is that once we decide on the kind of competition we're gonna do, human beings wanna win at the competition, right? So their motivation becomes not, it becomes winning at the competition and not training for war. Okay, so this is, this is exactly the conundrum you're just mentioning, okay? So how do we do that? Well, I'll tell you a story. Hopefully it's a short one. But when I, I was one of the guys in the early days of the Ranger Regiment learning CQB that was fortunate enough to go train with some other uh, organizations that had really good CQB skills. I brought back modern shooting to 1st Ranger Battalion. We started a club. Every Sunday we used to have a shooting match there. Uh, practical shooting, meaning shooting under the timer, you know, et cetera. And we used to call it the Sunday night slaughter, so. But, uh, and our skill level got really high, right? With that being said, we soon started sh shooting in civilian competitions, and we noticed that we were totally different than them. Everybody in our club was a ranger, and we were all combat veterans, and we were all thinking about training as war, and so we did think tactically. And everybody they, that we were going to shoot against did not, because they were just concerned about the game, right? So what we do with combatives is we take that in context. How do we get the best we can out of the training to drive the level as high as possible and yet still maintain our focus on the battlefield? And then we have to have formal training um, events to make sure that's the case. So for example, if you're the, if you're the you know, uh, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu champion of the world, this doesn't mean you know how to protect from punches because in the game of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or wrestling or whatnot, nobody's hitting you, right? So what's the defense of the double leg takedown in boxing? Well, it really isn't one because boxers are training to win boxing matches, right? And in boxing matches, you can't do the double. So, so what do we do? Well, we train both, you know? We were trained in boxing, those skills are all great skills, and we're trained in ground grappling, those skills are all great skills, and we're trained in takedowns, and we're putting them in the context of mission accomplishment by doing scenario training and whatnot. So now you've got all those generic skills and that car drives up to your traffic control point and you've got to get them out of there. You understand my point? So pretty soon, by taking that sort of approach, all, we're, we're rounding out all those skills and we're not falling down the rat hole of being you know, really, really great at uh, jiu-jitsu or taekwondo or boxing or any of those. 
without the, the whole package. I hope that makes, your set, makes sense to you, okay? Okay, so we're out of time. Matt, I really appreciate coming to talk. Um, for everybody else, we don't have any more NWI events for the semester. Um, do visit our website. We will have a podcast with Matt, and we'll put it up on the website. Uh, we just had General Perkins' uh, podcast released this morning. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a good day. Thanks a lot, guys.